dividend entirely. You know, we in the House are not willing to do that. Just, um, yeah, yeah, just to follow up and just to be very clear, um, our caucus wants to ensure that we have a permanent fund dividend going on into the future. Uh, there's legislation by Representatives Ledoux and Representative Tuck to permanently enshrine the permanent fund dividend in the Constitution. Um, that's among some of the discussions we're having today, but we must at all costs preserve the permanent fund dividend. It's such an important thing for families, uh, for seniors, for folks in rural Alaska uh, to rely on. Uh, and, you know, and, and as Representative Seaton said, um, their own advisors at the Permanent Fund Board said a 5.25% a draw or 5.5% draw as they've, uh, as they've introduced um, has a 60% of failure. A 60% of failure means that they're gambling with our Permanent Fund Dividend. And I don't think that uh, legislators on this side are sta are, will stand for that. Um, so we need to come to compromise. Um, the compromising team uh, and the chairs of the Finance Committee are there to do that. Um, but again, it's, it's so important that we protect the permanent fund dividend, and that's really what, what we care about. Well, and on that theme of uh, the Senate Majority Press Conference yesterday, I guess what surprised me was the fact that there's a lot of bright lines being drawn in the sand at an early uh, part of the session when in order to get things done, you know, we in the House Majority Coalition can't do everything by ourselves, of course. We need to be able to work with the Senate, certainly with the governor. Uh, the minority of the House plays a role as well. And to, to hear uh, sort of absolute statements about things are going great, we don't need to look at any other sources of new revenue. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad assumptions baked into the governor's budget that, uh, you know, we're not going to hold the PUMV as hostage and, and sort of strong statements like that, I don't think brings us any closer to compromise. And really, it's compromise that's going to bring us to a sustainable fiscal plan and also get, get us out uh, of June or early on time. So, you know, I, when I first got here to the session, I really felt optimistic about getting done in 90 days, you know, that we could get our work done and get out of here on time. But I'm getting less uh, encouraged, and I would say that as of yesterday, I'm pretty discouraged and I see more gridlock, and I see a lot of stalemating coming up, and I see a lot of uh, absolute, hard and fast, uh, we're not going to change our mind kind of positions on a very important uh, public policy issues, and certainly the future of the state in our hands. Um, I'd like to add one thing along that line since you brought up uh, new revenue, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday I had a constituent in my office who is the high school liaison to her city council. And we were talking about different things up to and including new revenue. And her response was, when are you guys going to get some new money? I mean, there's, and she named off all the different taxes and said, we're more in, interested in an income tax. It doesn't have to be real high, but an income tax, but we have to do something. And I thought to myself, isn't this interesting? A high school gal gets it, and so do all of her people that she brought in with her from high school, and our senators can't quite come to grasp with that, and I found that to be very interesting. <laughs> Steve. Um, you spoke of gridlock. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't that take uh, two to have gridlock? Well, absolutely, and compromise takes two as well. And, uh, you know, I think we've been pretty open. Um, all the major addresses I've done as presiding officer in the House, uh, you know, have been couched in language about compromising, coming to the table. Um, you know, we're willing to flex in our positions. We're willing to consider alternatives. We're willing to uh, certainly not only put a budget together this year as required to by the Constitution, but as well to take that harder look out in the future. And, you know, what are essential services in Alaska? <clears throat> How big should the permanent fund dividend be? You know, what um, what uh, kind of a structured draw are we going to employ with uh, the earnings from the res uh, the permanent fund itself? Big, tough questions that are in front of us, and uh, I think to sort of draw those sharp lines in the sand this early in the session um, does not lend itself to compromise or to having that kind of uh, willingness to work together as sort of co-partners in the legislature to get things done. Um, Representative Seaton, can you talk a little bit about um, the direction of the budget? Um, we know from presentations that there were some, uh, at least from some analyses, uh, identified some uh, wrong assumptions in the budget from the administration. Uh, how do you plan on reconciling any of that? 
Well, uh, the budget as it came from the governor's uh, office um, did have some problems for us in, in normal budgeting because it assumed a number of bills that were going to affect the budget would pass, and they incorporated those into the budget numbers. So, of course, those are fiscal notes on bills when they pass, and that's the way they're funded. So we're having to pull those uh, funds out of the budget and attach those as fiscal notes if the bills pass. And so there's quite a bit of work that we're having to go through in the budget assumptions, and um, so that'll all come out. And the subcommittees are hard at work on the numbers section of the budget, and uh, most of those things where they were incorporated in were in the language section. I guess that's getting down in the weeds. But anyway, those uh, sections are being addressed as well. So we're pulling those monies out, and they'll come as fiscal notes if the bills pass. Are you talking about the supplementals, or are you talking about the budget in general? I, I, I can talk about the supplementals um, because we have a pretty large supplemental in the Department of Corrections. Um, the Department of Corrections came to us and said um, the price tag for incarcerating individuals is expensive. Uh, it will likely cost more, and as a result, we have a pretty large supplemental, about $10 million for inmate health care and population management. And, um, you know, those are, those are things that the department... Uh, came to us uh, early in the session, and, and the legislature as a whole, um, you know, basically denied those requests. But, you know, they're coming back on a supplemental uh, despite what the, the administration had originally said that they needed. Um, so, uh, and plus there's just more people in jail, and that's something that you can't account for. Um, one last question since I've got the mic for a while. Um, Representative Stewart, could you please talk about uh, HB 199, where it is, because there's other uh, moving parts that could affect HB 199 in that being the ballot initiative and the April Supreme Court hearing. Thank you. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, first, let me say that there is a clear distinction between the ballot initiative and House Bill 199. House Bill 199 is a um, process of bringing all the stakeholders together, whether it be the resource companies, um, the fishermen, everybody. So it's a, it's a work in progress. Next week is the UFA meeting. We're looking to um, engage them in the conversation. So it's moving forward, but it's still a draft document based on input we're getting from the stakeholders and the affected people. We, we want to maintain a healthy, sustainable fishery why allowing development in this state to continue on with that in mind, maintaining a healthy fishery. Um, the intent, this is a pro-fishing bill, and it's getting confused with an anti-resource uh, bill, and which is why I say it is a draft Bill, it is a document that is being worked on continually with the input of all the stakeholders, including the resource people. So we're moving it along, and I'm excited about it. It's, it's shaping up. We should have a new uh, draft out, I'm going to say, in the next few weeks that will show some of the additional changes we were able to make with the input that we've received. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, uh, David Thiel has given estimates of the deficit as being in the six to eight hundred million dollar range after um, some sort of uh, uh, after a draw, the proposed draw from the permanent fund earnings. Um, the PFD proposals have run seven to eight hundred million, and the House version of HB twenty six calls for a new revenue of six hundred fifty million. Do you see a, a choice between PFD, the the continued existence of the PFD? and uh, new revenue for the state. Well, um, Speaker, yeah, I will address that. You know, we passed a comprehensive fiscal plan that included maintaining a, um, a very effective and long-term uh, PFD, making sure that that's one of the pillars of the plan we had. The other was a broad-based tax. 
uh, and the other was looking at uh, changing the oil taxes so that we got more fair value for oil taxes. Uh, two of those pillars have been somewhat rejected by the uh, Senate to date. So we are left with this large budget deficit even after taking a sustainable draw from the earnings reserve. So yes, we have a problem. I mean, uh, it's not very many Alaskans that don't realize you have a problem when you look at that depletion down to the barest minimum level of the CBR in about six years. And so if we start treating the earnings reserve the same way, we've got an additional problem because when that gets down, then there is no PFD. And so, yes, we need uh, alternative revenues to make sure that we're diversified as well as making sure that we can maintain a PFD. I mean, and there are people on the Senate side that will uh, readily admit that uh, they are looking only at the earnings uh, reserve, and if the PFD goes away, that will be just fine with them uh, instead of having any other broad-based revenue. I mean, they've said that openly, is that no broad-based revenue until the PFD is gone, and we're not, um, the House majority just does not agree with that. The PFD is such a vital portion of our economy and to all Alaskans' lives, uh, the diversity of people across the state, it's integral with Alaska. And so um, we want to maintain that for sure. And Andrew, I, I just wanted to sort of shift the, the dialogue just a little bit um, and talk about oil and gas. Um, you know, it was, I think we celebrated um, last week when uh, both BP and ConocoPhillips announced their um, annual annual uh, profits to their uh, shareholders at the global executive meeting. Um, you know, BP made three point four billion dollars in earnings last year. Um, they only made one hundred and fifteen the year before. Most of that was in the state of Alaska. ConocoPhillips made uh, six hundred and fifty two million dollars this year in Alaska alone. Uh, last year they made two hundred and thirty three. They're celebrating um, their profits, and and we are too. Uh, but I think at the same time that we're talking about permanent fund dividends, um, we aren't talking about the big profit makers in the state of Alaska. I, I think that's a, a mistake. Um, I hope that this, uh, I, I know that the, in the Resources Committee, they currently have a piece of legislation dealing with oil and gas taxes. Um, I hope that we have a chance to look at that in the Finance Committee at some point in time. Um, but it just, you know, the roughly the same amount that we're shelling out um, in profits and tax credits and tax deductions is the amount of the permanent fund cut. I think that's something that needs to be noted. Well, and I, I just want to jump in and add one more thing, Andrew, because I, I thought your question was particularly insightful, and that is with those six to eight hundred million dollar deficits going forward, that's also in an environment where you're continuing to cut education to uh, K through uh, to uh, K through twelve schools. You're essentially cutting health and social services. You're downsizing the university. You've got a minimal capital budget. You're not accounting for any supplemental expenses expenses, any pension obligation uh, funding uh, requirements that may come up, that were expected to come up. So that's essentially going forward with largely kind of a bare bones outlook on the spending side of things. And uh, again, tough choices, big issues, too early to make uh, sort of bright lines in the sand. Let's sit down, let's talk about it. We have a lot ahead of us and we can manage our way out of this if we work together. I have several more questions, so I'll ask them <laughs> afterward. But um, this one's to you, Representative Kawasaki. Um, two years ago in the Bill Ray Center, you were one of the folks who voted against moving a PMV out of House Finance and to the floor. I wanted to ask, um, has your position changed and why? Um, no, it really hasn't. Uh, the plan that was proposed was a PFD only plan. Uh, it took from every Alaskan first. Um, that was the only plan that came forward. Uh, currently, that's the only plan that is di being discussed in the Senate. Uh, I think that's a huge mistake. I think it's a huge mistake for uh, the 700,000 Alaskans that benefit from a PFD. Um, and, uh, and so my, my, uh, I haven't changed my mind on that at all. Yeah, just to follow up on that real quick, right now, the only thing that's being proposed is a POMV, I mean, 
does that mean you would vote against that if that's the only thing that's proposed? Well, um, thanks again for the question. I think that there's there are other things that are being discussed. I, I just mentioned in the Resources Committee, uh, there's an oil tax bill dealing with the minimum floor. Um, there are bills that are floating in both the House and the Senate um, that can deal with a comprehensive fiscal plan. Uh, that's something that uh, this body has undertaken, has said that it's a priority. Uh, it's something that the governor has worked on. Um, and, uh, and I think it's something that deserves uh, attention and deserves um, the attention of the Senate, at least to listen to, at least to, to, to come up with some sort of a compromise. I mean, we've, we've done a lot in the House in the last year, and uh, it, within those 90 days, uh, we passed a comprehensive fiscal plan that balanced our budget and, uh, and into, the, into, the, into the future uh, and kept a permanent fund dividend that would constantly increase. Um, that's, I think, what Alaskans really need at this time and really want. Okay, thank you, everyone. See you here, same time, same place next week. <laughs>